And now we can move to Wojciech Szczerba from Evangelical School of Theology in Wrocław and from Van Hügel Institute or at St. Edmund's College, University of Cambridge. And I can see Wojciech is with us. Wojciech will give a talk on the concept of universal salvation in the thought of Friedrich Schleiermacher. Uh, okay, I will display the Wojciech's uh, talk right now and we, will, we could have a discussion on Schleiermacher and the universal salvation after it. The concept of eternal salvation in the thought of Friedrich Schleiermacher. The philosophical concept of universal salvation, apokatastas, is shaped in the Greek and Christian thought, basically means the restoration of the primal state of existence of creation, which has been lost due to the original sin or the law of necessity. In the early philosophical traditions, the restoration is understood most of all in the macro scale and refers to the entire reality. In the later post-Platonic philosophical systems, where the human being becomes the center of interest, apocatastasis is rendered particularly with a reference to the human soul or the divine element embodied in the rational uh, creation. Restoration of the primal state means here the abolition of everything, including the suffering and death, and the renewal of, of the perfect original relationship between the creator and creation, or actualization of the intended plan of the creator creator for the creation. In the Christian thought, the concept of the universal scope of salvation takes various forms and various levels on, of certainty. Sometimes apocatastasis is understood in terms of amnesty, especially in the thought systems, which particularly stress the sovereignty and the power of God, like Gregor of Nyssa. Yet sometimes apocatastasis takes the form of the general repentance, where the emphasis is put on the freedom of creation, the pedagogical dimension of the relation of the creator to the creation, like origin. In most cases, the Christian version of the universal salvation assumes the eschatological preservation of the identity and consciousness of the creation. Yet some Christian thinkers, especially those affiliated with the Neoplatonic tradition, point to the possible eschatological dissolving of the creation in God, culminating in the return of the rational being to the idea in the mind of God, like Ryugana, in such a way that finally God will be all in all, 1 Corinthians 15. The concept of apocatastasis was condemned during the Second Council of Constantinople in 553 and the subsequent councils. Nevertheless, it has not disappeared from the Christian thought in its various proveniences, both in the medieval and modern ages. At the turn of the 18th and 19th centuries, Friedrich Schleiermacher, an outstanding philosopher and theologian of the Reformed tradition, gets close in his thought system to the concept of universal salvation. How Schleiermacher, growing out of conservative, pietistic, reformed, Protestant circles, reaches the hope of salvation of all the people? In my analysis of Schleiermacher's understanding religion and his soteriology, I'm limiting, limiting most of all to his early treatise, speeches to its cultural despisers, especially its first unrevised edition is important from the philosophical perspective. Equally important for the analysis of the concept of religion, the thought of Schleiermacher, is his later book, Christian Faith. It is a much more mature and dogmatically correct writing than the early speeches. It indicates the evolution of the thought of a German thinker. Additionally, Schleiermacher's essay on the doctrine of election with special references to aphorisms of Dr. Brett Schneider may be seen as some kind of introduction to the treatise Christian faith. In the essay, the theologian refers to the doctrine of predestination, but portrays it in a radical way as predestination of all the people to salvation by God. So how Schleiermacher understands religion? Most of all, he opposes treating religion as a category of outer ecclesiastical systems. Religion understood in such a way is nothing more than the product of calculation of human mind. It shrinks the transcendental matters to the language and images of people. Religion should not be restricted to morality either. The piety is not the condition sine qua non of moral life, as Spinoza proved. It is possible to live morally while not believing in God. And finally, religion should not be equated with metaphysics, since metaphysics, according to Kant's epistemology, is inaccessible to human beings. Getting tangled up with metaphysical attempts to describe religion leads at best to new mythology 
and false image of religion. In the speeches, Schleiermacher defends the esoteric, apophatic nature of religion and points to the mystery which is inevitably included in it. In every religion, he says, what is holy remains a mystery and is hidden from the profanes. The true religion, according to Schleiermacher, is based on a special kind of experience, gefühl, and intuition, anschau, the theologian speaks about it, an overwhelming but transient moment, augenblick, when a person experiences the totality of the world, merges with it, and becomes one with the universe. It is a total experience which precedes any kind of reflection, any consideration of the experience. In this moment, that which is infinite and limitless takes over what is finite and limited. It is also a passing experience. It disappears as quickly as the person realizes its existence. The feeling, the consciousness acquired in the moment of merging with the universe becomes the essence of religion, the principle of piety of the person. Thus, religion is not the very perception of the experience. It is not the object which is perceived. It is the primal, undefined experience of merging with the universe and the feeling which the experience leaves. In the first edition of the speech, Shalya Maha writes about the intuition of the world stressing the direct precognitive relation to the universe. In the later editions, and the treatise The Christian Faith, he defines religion as a feeling of total dependence on the universe. And in the letter to his friend Luca, he points to the religious direct existence dependency. In the same time, Schleiermacher maintains that religion is the sense and taste for the infinite, God consciousness, which every person has, and is nothing else than the feeling of total dependence. The religious predisposition, according to Schleiermacher, is universal in its character. It can be developed, actualized in every person, strengthening God consciousness in them. After all, all people are equal, which is expressed by the biblical theological concept of Imago Dei. Every person is an image of infinity in the finite world. What is the place of Christianity, then, in the thought of Schleiermacher? Religion per se, as it is understood by Schleiermacher, is universal in its character. Intuition and feeling cannot be limited to one theologian ecclesiastical system. Religion in general is infinite in its character, just as the universe is infinite, which it reveals. Nevertheless, even though the religious intuition is limitless in its nature, still by necessity it is exemplified first in the personal piety religion, a second in historical, historically shaped religious systems. In this sense, Schleiermacher cannot equate Christianity and the general religion. He can at most maintain that Christianity is one of the forms, expressions of religion, which can be captured, described by various traditions and practices. Nevertheless, Schleiermacher grants Christianity the highest position among historical religions arguing that it most often and preferably watches the universe in religion and its history, and as such it is kind of religion of religions. Likewise, Christ, in his understanding, is the highest mediator between the human being and God. Christ was human with perfect God consciousness, which actually embodied in him the divine and through him developed in other people, religious presupposition, God consciousness. Christianity, from this perspective, exemplifies the higher religious potency. It observes the religion and finds in its frame of reference. Therefore, Schleiermacher maintains that the original intuition of Christianity is always valid, and all religions, in a sense, refer to the core of Christianity as God consciousness, so they become somehow the palingenesis of Christianity. Yet Christianity as such has its limits and will reach them when humanity will finally mature spiritually and will understand that the essence of religion is the universal feeling of dependence and all kinds of mediators between humanity and the universe are unnecessary. Christianity 
he says, exalt, exalted above them all religions, more historical and more humble in its glory, has expressly acknowledged this transitoriness of its temporal existence. A time will come when there shall be no more any mediator, but the Father shall be all in all. Schleiermacher's understanding of religion in terms of intuition and feeling leads him close to a pan-entheistic uptake of reality, according to which the divinity contains in itself the universe, but the universe does not limit the divinity. According to his position, historic religions, including Christianity, merely exemplify the primal experience of the universe, an experience which is available to every person. Such an understanding of the essence of religion leads the theologian to universalistic soteriological beliefs. How does he get close to the concept of universal salvation? Schleiermacher, coming from the pietistic reformed conservative tradition, which defines the Calvinistic teaching of predestination. Following Augustine and Calvin, he upholds the radical version of the doctrine, pointing that it has strong basis in the scripture and tradition. However, while the Calvinistic concept of predestination contains double aspect of predestination to salvation and condemnation based on twofold will of God for two elected group of people, Schleiermacher claims that first, the doctrine should be rendered with reference to the whole humanity, not individual people, and second, it should be understood in terms of one God's decree predestinating the whole human race to salvation. Schleiermacher does not explicitly advocate the concept of the renewal of all things, apocatastasis, but gets very close to it in his essay, on the doctrine of election, he opposes the teaching of the eternal condemnation and is aware that such a position brings him closer to the teaching of the final restoration, just like the church fathers. It is difficult for him to accept the teaching of the limited scope of salvation if God, the final owner, the final director of reality, wants all people to be saved. Still, is it possible that part of humanity will not enter, the inner community will be eternally condemned. Schleiermacher does not answer all the possible questions concerning the scope of salvation. After all, eschatology exceeds the cognitive possibilities of human beings and gets close to metaphysical considerations. Yet, a number of arguments opposes the concept of limited scope of salvation. First, the final condemnation contradicts the concept of sovereignty of God, which the Reformed tradition and Schleiermacher maintains. God fully and undeniably rules over the created reality, and his decrees are absolute in their character. Even faith of a person is finally worked out by God, even though it appears as a free act from the level of human existence. And second, the eternal condemnation contradicts the endless love of the sovereign God, who creates human being according to his image, bestows his spirit upon him, and predestines people to salvation. Is it possible that anybody can effectively oppose the plan of the Creator, especially that according to Christian orthodoxy, human beings are related day to God, and evil, understood as the absence of God, does not have ontological status? And third, the concept of the eternal condemnation seems to undermine the effectiveness of the redeeming word of Christ. If Christ is, in the biblical language, the archpriest who serves everybody, intercedes for everybody, and finally dies for everybody, then how to combine it with the fact that some people are eternally rejected by God based in his sovereign will? Does it not discredit the work of Christ? And Finally, it is difficult to accept, according to Schleiermacher, the possibility of final condemnation of part of humanity from a simply psychological perspective. If the redeeming means the con conversion of consciousness of a person, according to which the sense of self is absorbed by the God consciousness, then the original egocentrism must be replaced by God's love. 
her for the whole human race. Such was the attitude of Christ, characterized by sympathia for the whole humanity and for every person. Such is also the attitude of the true church, body of Christ, which absorbs the Christ consciousness, taking into consideration the necessary Christian attitude of care for another person. It is difficult to accept the concept of damnation and eternal separation from God of part of humanity with simultaneous belief in an unending happiness, salvation of another part. The eschatological future exceeds the cognitive horizons of humanity and it's not easy to speculate about its nature. Schleiermacher is aware of it and indicates directly that it is difficult to relate the present reality to the future surpassing the course of human history. Individual consciousness post-mortem, possibility of conversion after death, symbolism of the final judgment, resurrection of all, return of Christ. These are the matters which are symbolically taught by the scripture, but which interpretation is not clear. Yet, they should affect the understanding of the present existence of human beings, strengthen their God consciousness now, and shape their attitude of care for others now. They should also point to the fundamental matters in God's plan of redemption, Heisgeschichte, such as God's desire to save all the people, future cleansing of people from the elements of sinfulness which still cling to them, or the hope for perfect community which God, with God in the future. By sketching such a perspective, Schleiermacher expresses his deep hope for the future universal and final restoration of all souls. However, he does not formulate, express his verbis, the concept of... Uh, thank you very much, uh, Wojciech. Uh, that was Wojciech Szczerba from Evangelical School of Theology in Wrocław and Van Hugo Institute at St. Edmunds College at University of Cambridge. Uh, now we will start with the questions, the questions on site from people who are here with us. No questions? Okay, um, I can see, yes, we have a questions from Anna and we also have some questions on the stream. We will start with, uh, with Anna. Oh, okay, Wojciech, thank, uh, thank you very much for interesting paper. I have some comments uh, on its um, patristic part. So, uh, Ap Apokastaza was condemned as, uh, by the Second Council of Constantinople as a part of Second or Orig Origianism, which was basically uh, not a uh, and I, uh, not something uh, invented by Origen himself, but rather uh, by Evagrius Ponticus. Uh, and uh, Evagrius was, uh, let's put it like this, self-proclaimed friend and uh, student of Gregory of Nyssa, Bezer the Great, and Gregory of Nazianzus. So the great Cappadocians. Whether he will indeed was the student or not, it's another question. Uh, there is however, a fact that, some facts at least, it's exactly what they're speaking in the review about Gregory of Nyssa. All of Evagrius' quite problematical claims about um, apocastasis of uh, absolute salvation with loss of self-identity of human in God can be basically found in Gregory of Nyssa. Not in the form of direct statements, but as necessary logical conclusions. So, uh, yeah, it's exactly an example of how close to a uh, heresy Gregory comes, uh, came. So, uh, basically, this is on, uh, the only comment that I had. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, uh, well, yeah, I agree. It's, it's a very interesting uh, concept. I think it's very, it's very important, apocatastasis. Uh, I, I agree with, uh, with the uh, connection with the concept uh, with Evagrius Ponticus and uh, Didymus the Blind, uh, and then the later thinkers. And it is, it's been very interesting for me that 
Well, regardless how many times it has been uh, condemned generally and in various traditions, various churches, it's still the the concept exists and uh, f- and I think it is uh, doing quite well in various traditions, uh, both in the, in the Orthodox tradition, in the Catholic tradition, or in Protestant tradition, even in the, in the some kind of conservative radical uh, aspects of uh, uh, yeah, of uh, the branches of uh, even of, of Protestant churches. Uh, yeah, and uh, <clears throat> typically uh, the, the classical apocatastasis, as I understand it, usually assumes that there is a preservation of uh, uh, identity uh, of a person somehow. But uh, yeah, there, there, especially in the, uh, as you say, as logical conclusions in uh, in Gregor of Nyssa, but also in later thinkers like Eryugena, this notion. Uh, of uh, return to the perfect context of being, to something what we call the beginning. But what is the beginning, or what is the perfect, uh, the, the perfect existence of uh, of uh, of rational beings? Is it, uh, let's say, the first stage of creatio, or rather, is it going back? Is it going to the mind of God somehow, to the idea of God? And some of the, of the thinkers would, would would say that well, that truly really apocatastasis means really somehow shrinking or dissolving. It's not the best word, sorry for that. In 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 the mind of God, going back to the idea of the mind of God. And I think this notion is very interesting and this is very attractive for the later thinkers uh, like uh, like Schleiermacher. Uh, who, in the, in the context of, of German Romanticism, and influenced by uh, Spinoza and Herder, somehow have this idea of of uh, of of not really of not really uh, referring to preservation of the uh, self identity or memory or anything like that. Thank you. I think that uh, dissolving is pretty good word because it was used, uh, at least in examples, by Gregory and Evagrius Ponticus when they are speaking about human being dissolved as a uh, as um, cropla of yeah, water, a small part of water, not, not a drop of water in the sea. See, in, the, you know, in this case, it's uh, that were clearly God. So, yes, it is dissolving in God, and in this on that matter, but it is dissolving. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we, we have some questions more. Um, Daniel Spencer, one of our participants, sent me two questions. Uh, basically, actually, one question in two parts. So, I will read it to you now, uh, Wojciech. In your view, is there adequate biblical warrant for the idea of restoration of the original unity, perfection of creation? Uh, and the other part is, is there not a case to be made that the biblical view points instead to, to a new creation that far surpasses the original integrity of Eden? Schleiermacher's view here is very near to Taoism. Yeah, um, thank you very much for the question. Let me refer to this uh, first part of the question. The, the biblical uh, evidence or warrant for the rest of, for the restoration. Uh, well, it's a uh, the answer might be complicated. Uh, well, the, well, let's say the philosophical answer. It depends. Depends how you uh, how you interpret uh, the Bible, and uh, the Bible is quite a complicated uh, collection of uh, of of scriptures that has been uh, put into a canon in uh, somewhere uh, finally uh, between uh, fourth and the fifth century, uh, with some reduction. Uh, uh, earlier on, which we can see as when we read the Old Testament or the New Testament, uh, you know, the, uh, let's say, the example, the letters to Corinthians, when we read the 
Second Corinthians, it's quite obvious that there was something in between, and read, and the second might be some kind of collection of uh, of two letters, like or the Gospel of John, the beginning and the end of Gospel of John. It seems like the redaction uh, or the editors uh, some kind of addition. So it, it depends how you understand and how you interpret uh, the Bible, and I think the basic hermeneutical rule is that. The difficult uh, aspects of the teaching of the Bible should be understood in the light of the easy uh, or the uh, obvious uh, teaching or chapters or uh, aspects of the Bible. Well, the question is which are difficult and which are the easy, the easy ones. Uh, and, and there are various traditions, and uh, when one tradition would, uh, when it when it comes to eschatology or soteriology, one would uh, claim or defend the limited scope of salvation. And this tradition would say the easier or the basic formulas and biblical formulas are the ones that say that that claim that there that there is going to be a, con- a condemnation. So these are the chapters that are talking about Gehenna and hell and the second death and uh, all this uh, apocalyptical language that is understood, let's say, more or less literally. And from this perspective. Uh, the aspects of the Bible which say or which teach the universal salvation or possibility of universal salvation may be understood as some kind of general will of God or potential will of God, whereas the uh, the, the actual will of God is somehow uh, is coincides with the fact that some people reject God. So this would be one perspective. The other perspective would uh, would claim or would say that the easy, the basic, the fun, the foundational uh, teaching of the Bible is the one that uh, speaks about the possibility of universal salvation. So, from this perspective, the chapters that are or the aspects that 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 seem to be teaching the limited scope of salvation can be seen as some kind of warning as some kind of pedagogical type of uh, teaching or pre-Pascal, uh, uh, pre-Passion uh, yeah, type of uh, uh, teachings, but they do not, finally, they will, they will not uh, be fulfilled in a literal, in a literal way. They should be rather understood as some kind of hyperbole. And yes, there are some aspects and some teachings of in the Bible that uh, that uh, um, well su- suggest the unlimited or universal scope of salvation. First of all, I would say that the whole idea of return is not new to the Bible. So, for instance, the, uh, John the Baptist is seen as the Elijah coming back figuratively, or Christ might be seen the new Moses or the second Adam. Or uh, when we read the language of the Apocalypse describing the new earth and new heaven, we see that there is reference to the metaphors or the language of the first chapters of the Bible. So there is some kind of reference uh, at the end of the Bible to the beginning of the, the, uh, the Bible. Okay, so the, the whole idea of return, which is somehow uh, innate in the whole concept of apocatastasis, apocatastasis is there. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, there are some particular teachings that may refer to this idea of, uh, of uh, universal salvation. For instance, uh, the simple teaching, yeah, the, 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 the chapter that I referred already in the second uh, letter to Corinthians 15, which says that everything will be subject, subjugated to God, and finally death will be subjugated to God together with Christ, and at the end God will be all in all, meaning that everything will be somehow culminated in God. So this would be one thing. The other, uh, this chapter is referring to the will of God, like in uh, the first uh, Timothy, second chapter, saying that God wants to save all the people. Similar, uh, similar uh, teaching we can find in the first letter to Peter. And also in Peter, in the third chapter, I think we can 
find this uh, reference of Christ going to Sheol and uh, proclaiming the gospel uh, to the spirits there. And the early uh, church tradition, like the gospel of Nicodemus, uh, well, well, points that uh, Christ effectively uh, proclaims the gospel so the Sheol or the hell really become, is empty. Or there is a reference to, the, to Christ uh, as the second Adam. So like with the first Adam, uh, the whole uh, the condemnation came to the whole uh, humanity or human race. With the second Adam, meaning, meaning Christ, with his work of salvation, similarly, the salvation is somehow given to the whole human race or something like this. So I think, yes, we can find the references in the Bible. There are more of them, but this might be, you know, some of the more, uh, more obvious ones. And uh, personally, I don't think that the Bible teaches about a new world or something like this. I think the teaching of the, of the Bible, especially the apocalypse is, um, well, is or the eschatological teaching, is refers to this earthly reality. So, yes, it might be different. It might be, um, well, the, the, well, there might be no death, no evil, nothing like that. But still, the Bible is speaking about the, the earth uh, in, the, in terms of eschatology, just like in the case of protology. The Eden is also on the earth. We may agree, we may not agree, we may, we may interpret it figuratively, but I think the Bible is really talking about this earthly reality. Okay, I think Daniel is happy with the answer. He also sends his greetings and he encourages you to enjoy his talk later in the afternoon session. We have uh, three questions more in the stream, but I see also Martin wants to ask something. Martin? Yeah, I was thinking also about uh, the patristic parallels. You know, in on the one hand, in Maximus Confessor, and actually already in Launches of, of Jerusalem, on the other hand, in Augustine, you have a phenomenology of human will in which you discuss, uh, in which you see, you describe human choices. And those human choices can go either by us following the natural order of priorities, I, I have an object, I choose it, I follow it, or can work as in Christ. And this is very important, especially in, as I could see in Laundries of Jerusalem and in Maximus. And in Christ, human will becomes quiet and just follows in faith the will of Christ. So human, a saved human is truly made son of God, or adoptive son of God. It's like Hiotheosis, because in him, like in Christ, or in her, like in Christ, human will stops looking itself for objects, stops making choices, but simply agrees quietly with will of God. And salvation is first and foremost this inner salvation. Purification is first and foremost this inner purification. Can you speak about universal salvation if you analyze human will and relationship of human to Christ in these terms? I'm trying to unmute myself, but it's not easy. <clears throat> I cannot answer because I cannot unmute myself. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <clears throat> I like the question. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, mm, yeah, well, <clears throat> let me let me refer to Schleiermacher. Okay, this the 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 answer might be different when we are talking about the uh, church fathers and when we are talking about Schleiermacher. And uh, uh, Schleiermacher, when he is composing his, uh, his treatises in the 18th century uh, and the beginning of uh, 19th century, well, he reads Spinoza. And <coughs> Spinoza and his, uh, his, his thought system is really 
I wouldn't say pantheistic. I would say monistic. It's really monistic. But Schleiermacher reads Spinoza through the eyes of Herder, uh, you know, the German thinker who is somehow Christianizing uh, Spinoza's, uh, Spinoza's monism. So, so still it, it is monistic, but it is, uh, <coughs> it, it is, uh, it is more, it is closer to, I should say, uh, Protestant uh, orthodoxy of the 18th and 19th century. And <clears throat> so this would be one aspect, and I would refer to your, to your question uh, in, in a minute. The other aspect is that, well, uh, Schleiermacher uh, discusses uh, uh, many things with Kant, Immanuel Kant. But he agrees that we cannot reach the things in themselves. We cannot know noumena, we can only see phenomena. So we can we talk about reality that is here, that, uh, that uh, in, in reality in which we see, but we don't really know how you know this whole metaphysical aspects of it uh, uh, looks like. We have no idea really. So <clears throat> and. Uh, from so uh, so this will be the second uh, second factor that is really important and the third factor that is really important is that Schleiermacher is reformed theologian reformed thinker which means that he is calvinistic which means that the sovereignty of god is a, a huge uh, thing for him is a, is a really his point of reference when he is talking about god and this is his upbringing in the pietistic context, and this is his studying in uh, in Halle and earlier in uh, in uh, in other schools. But it is really God that is the owner of reality, and God creates everything, everything for him. So even you now the the will of God is created by God. The faith is created by God. The human beings cannot produce them by themselves. Or even sin or other sinfulness is also created by God. God is some kind of the author of the, of the sinfulness uh, somehow, which would be, uh, I think, uh, coherent with a, let's say, panentheistic attitude to reality. Everything is happening in God. So I would say that apocatastasis, from this perspective, from this philosophical perspective, is the fact. It is happening right now. So it is realized as catology. We don't have to. We don't have to wait for you know the future or anything like this. It is. There is no other option because everything is already in God. Everything is already, let's say, safe. But these are metaphors. And in our phenomenological language and in our perceiving of reality, we see ourselves as free human beings, as human beings making choices, as, you know, just, uh, well, going this or that way. And this might be our common, uh, common understanding of reality. However, Again, when we look at it from a more theological perspective, and for him this would be Reformed theology, he would say, now, now everything, really everything, is worked out by God. So God is the owner of reality and the director of reality. And now going back to the, to the Church Fathers, I don't think that it is very far from f some aspects of, again, Gregory of Nyssa. I think that the, there is this idea of, in, in, in Nyssa's thinking, of the East, for instance, going to of the metaphor of the East, that, uh, well, you have the East that, that, that let's say, that, that incarnate, where he, when he refers to incarnation uh, of, uh, of Christ, he somehow refers to this divinity of Christ merging with humanity of Christ, and this is the moment when everything is somehow saved because this this yeast of divinity somehow changes uh, the whole human race. So 
again, from, uh, uh, from, from this perspective, we may say, yes, phenomenologically speaking, we may talk about uh, our will and our choices uh, and uh, this kind of things. But from the other, on the other hand, we may just refer to God who works out everything. This would be my reference, and I see Anna Zirkova, who will, I'm, I'm sure she will refer to my comment. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, first of all, uh, as to your comment about uh, Gregory of Nyssa speaking of Christology, uh, we shouldn't forget about one thing. When uh, Cappadocians uh, try to make any Christological claims, it was way before Christolo uh, the hardcore Christological controversies. So they had, uh, they didn't need to uh, to feed some uh, doctrinal uh, limits. It's not limits, okay? It's not limits. It's some uh, doctrines because those doctrines were not formulated yet. But if you see their claims through later councils, again, it's on the, board, uh, on the border of orthodoxy, somehow, and it's on its way to uh, metaphysicism. Let's, uh, let's put it like this. But I'm not going to accuse them. They had all rights to make mistakes because the doctrine wasn't formulated yet. And even after proclamation of Chalcedon II and, uh, and of, uh, I'm sorry, Cons uh, Chalcedon and Constantinople II, uh, there still wasn't, uh, to say the truth, uh, teaching. There are just some things that were rejected. That's it. But, but let me return to the Constantinople II. Apocastasis was condemned and forced seven councils as are accepted as, as truly ecumenical by all of the main denomination, Christian denominations. And you cannot treat it as so freely. Obviously, as I said it in the beginning, they're not in the beginning of my first comment, uh, Apocastasis was condemned by Constantinople II as a part of Second Origianism, Evagrianism, to say the truth, no matter how much somebody wants to whitewash Evagrius himself in the Nova days. Uh, but what, what was the main, main uh, point of the uh, Reginianism? You remember your comment about theology being outcome of philosophy, and philosophy makes theology. Or the second originism was exactly this. It was the outcome of philosophy. It first thing, the second thing, it proclaimed Christ to be just and only creature. The first, the perfect, but just and only creature. All other things fall from it. And apocastasis is a part of the, well, this kind of thinking. Um, I know about freedom in philosophy, but and I understand Schleiermacher, and I am being born in the East, I'm kind of inclined to go forward. At least I hope for uh, for apocastasis, not apocastasis itself, but that there is a hope, like it's in Dostoevsky, for instance, you know. But still, you cannot easily forget about the, fa the fact of condemnation. That's it. Thank you very much. I love it. I love it. And I think... I really, I really think we can talk about apocatastasis in terms of doctrine, and yeah, I agree it's dangerous, or we can talk about hope, and then I would say, yeah, it's beautiful. And uh, I would also say that, well, both, or many other thinkers or theologians like uh, Origen or Gregory of Nyssa or Ed Eugena or the others that you referred uh, to, or I would say also Schleiermacher, they are very bold thinkers. And Schleiermacher, especially, you know, the, you know the, the Protestant, he's a free mind, really. I mean, he's really trying to find himself between Enlightenment and Romanticism and uh, Protestant uh, Lutheranism and Protestant Reformed theology and then some pietistic thinking. 
and then he's really he's really bold in uh, he's not afraid to uh, to give uh, some idea or propose some ideas that are that would that would say, that we would say they are unorthodox and well this is what he says about doctrines that well he says that the essence of religion is esoteric uh, and we cannot really describe it. So our doctrines are some kind of approximations. We are trying to do our best to uh, to to say, to, to describe, to predicate about about religion. But it's not the perfect language. And from this perspective, he says that heresy might be equally important as the right doctrine. And quite often, heresy is where well, is. <laughs> is posteriori uh, defined as uh, as heresy but really um, theology lives in some kind of dialectical way and uh, uh, theologian cannot be afraid to formulate or thinker cannot be cannot be afraid to formulate uh, ideas even if they are risky and certainly Schleiermacher is not a, is not afraid or I would say differently as a young Schleiermacher is not afraid of all, uh, at all he's I mean he really formulates ideas freely but then he gets older and he well he uh, he uh, builds his career so in the beginning he is just uh, uh, you know, the beginner uh, theologian or thinker. But then he cooperates with Humboldt. He's one of the major politicians, diplomat, and he's a rector of the old university. So in his later treatises, we see that trying to correct himself and his language becomes a little bit more orthodox. So for instance, when we compare the, third, the second and the third edition of the speeches, we see that he is trying to remove some of the ideas that might be seen as uh, linking him to Spinoza or linking him to Immanuel Kant, which was who was not that popular popular later on. But still, some of this boldness of Schleiermacher remains, and I think this might be one of the, well, characteristic of this uh, Protestant free thinking leading to a very liberal Theology and and actually Schleiermacher influenced the later really radical theologians like Harnack or Ritchel, uh, or even Karl Barth, who is a neo orthodox theologian. I absolutely agree with what you have, what you said about heresy. In my opinion, it is necessary necessary element for healthy developed theological doctrine. If there are no heresies, there is no development what we see nowadays. And this boldness is nothing more or less but an evidence but an evidence that a thinker had strong faith in what he said and in what he believed. So and we are lacking such thinkers right now, unfortunately. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And again, I love it. And I, I and I agree. When we, it's it's not easy to find a really nice heresy nowadays. So when we find it, we should really treat it with care. We should love it. We should <laughs> not take we should take care of it because it's it's not an easy thing today. Uh, in some paper I wrote, what, uh, the, I'm looking for the, my enemy. I'm looking for the heresy. Come to me. I need you. <laughs> I think Martin might be your heresia. Um, okay. Uh, to an extent. Next, uh, can we move to the next question, please? Uh, we received a few, three or four. I think the one was already answered. It was following. Was an apocostasis one of the heresies in the first ages of Christianity? For it hits in the idea of the free will. Um, so I guess you already answered it, didn't you? Okay, and the other question is uh, from the stream. If I understood you correctly, you said that Christianity is one of the form of the religious ways of seeking God. 
the end of quotation. So the revelation of Christ is contingent, not essential, and all Judaism and Christianity is relative because of its historical and cultural circumstances. I think it's is that clear to you? Is this is this question? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, thank you for uh, for this question. I well, yeah, I refer to the thought of Friedrich Schleiermacher, and this is how he understands it. Uh, he th he thinks that the essence of religion is the is the feeling, is the experience of the of the universe, of the total dependence of the of the universe, and this feeling that is intuitive and cannot be properly described is somehow put into the language of doctrines or traditions. And yes, Christianity is uh, just one, or uh, he would say Christianity is a cluster of traditions, and there are some differences within Christianity. So, yeah, there are other religions, and other religions also refer, uh, refer experience that is universal. And uh, more than that, he would differentiate between personal spirituality or personal piety, personal re religion, and historical type of religions. And he would also say, well, this is how we refer to this experience, to this feeling, the feel or the intuition, anshau, that we, that we have, that, that is really the core of our religion. But, but speaking about religions, he somehow makes a gradation, gradation of this religion, some kind of hierarchy. So he says, well, when we are thinking of the development of humanity, human race, we may say that the, the lower, the lowest are the animistic religions. Then there are, are plural, pluralistic religions. And then there are uh, monotheistic religions. Out of them, Christianity is the highest. So he himself, being a Christian, believes that Christianity is the highest form of the religion or the historical religion. Uh, he doesn't refer to other religions except of Judaism, and I don't think that he knows other religions well. Uh, even when he refers to Judaism, he somehow thinks that Christianity is a form, not really of continuation, but some kind of development of his thinking. And when he's talking about the major hermeneutical idea of Judaism, he refers to revenge or the lex talionis. And when he's talking about Christianity, he, th he says that the core of Christianity, the, the basic formula, the intuition of Christianity is God's love. And this is for him the highest form of um, description of this religious uh, experience. And then definitely he says that, yes, religious will pass away. And... Uh, He's very optimistic in his thinking. This might be, you know, this uh, romantic, romantic um, thinking, uh, romantic optimism that he believes that that really all the nations will become Christians. And this is what he says in his in his experience. Really, Christianity growing from one person or twelve apostles into you know the whole Western world being Christian. So he believes that the whole world becomes. Christians, finally. But then he also says that Christianity also has its limits. So it will pass away. But it will pass away in a kind of eschatological terms. Christianity will get mature and will understand that the mediators between human beings or humanity and, and God or universe, divine deity, are not necessary. And this will be the moment where Christianity also will pass away and God will be all in all, as he refers to Second uh, Corinthians 15. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, basically, we have run of time, but the, the, the keynote lecture is cancelled. I will talk about it later so we can have a few minutes more. I received one question after what Anna said, so I will, I will read it now. I think it sheds some light. Uh, Aren't we, according to the Bernard from, from Clairvaux and Apostolic Letters, living between two comps of Christ, the one that happened 2,000 years ago, and Parousia? And there is a third common of Christ in meantime. Assuming the first two, we live between the first and the second, but we know that Christ is the same today and ever. 
Therefore, the beginning at the end is the same, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's Anna who should answer that. You see, uh, this is quite a difficult question because uh, with same logic applied, they can say that nothing, uh, nothing is changed, and they are coming to God. So they are they have they will have clearly circle idea of the of uh, theory of time and of theory of, uh, of creation, which uh, is found, for instance, in Stoics and in the Epicurean school, in uh, pretty not uh, pretty much all, but in the huge part of ancient and philosophical thinking about the world and creation part. So, what is the difference? You see, the fourth and the second parousia are different in its theological and, theolo and uh, ontological essence. You may think even about not the fourth and the second. You, uh, if you think about creation as be being uh, as creation through Christ and as uh, uh, and uh, Adam as uh, to an extent uh, an image of Christ. Christ is the true first Adam. Uh, you have three parousias. The first one is the creation of the world. The, the second one is the salvation of the world. Uh, in the meaning of Christ give, uh, giving himself for our sins. And the third one is a theosis. It is deification. But we are achieving the unity with God. So the beginning and the end is not necessarily the same. At the beginning, we have God and his creation, which is totally different ontologically, with this huge gap between them. At the end, we have God who, to, who will take his creation up to him and who, through uh, grace, through, through Christ, through salvation, which was done by Christ, who elevates humanity and the entire world to be his true sons, to be his true children. And he will ele elevate them to be on the image of God, on true image of God, and to be deified. So, from the point of view of God, there is no real difference. From the point of view of a creation, we have a huge road of being nothing, of being made out of nothing, to becoming deified. So, if there is difference, it's difference, the difference is for us. This is what comes to my mind right now. Okay, uh, thank you for the answer. Would you, would you like to add something? Yeah, I, I'm so glad Anna is here. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I think that this uh, German theologian, uh, Jürgen Moltmann, he refers to this process that Anna described. And he refers to um, uh, Imago Dei as a first stage, then Imago Christi as this whole process of Heilsgeschichte or the uh, history of salvation, and then Gloria Dei. And the Gloria Day would be the final stage. So this uh, this shows some kind of progression. And I think yes, in the classical cultures, and especially when we were talking about this cosmic apocatastasis, like Stoics and Anna refer to it, we may talk about this the same the same idea. But then when we are referring to apocatastasis that is personal or refers to soul or yeah, or, or, or anthropological, human, some kind of apocatastasis, we're, we're probably talking more about actualization or some kind of theological aspect of apocatastasis. So, so there is some kind of return to the moment when there is no death, no evil, there is a perfect community between um, rational beings or human beings and God, but yes, there is a development in the, on, on the way. 
and we can see it in the uh, in the process of origin when he's asking when he's answering the question why uh, the rational uh, creations will not fall again and he says well they will learn in the process of of existing uh, they will learn about god's love their nature and uh, this kind of things and uh, yeah, and uh, um, so uh, yeah, and and then we also see it in some kind of anthropology of Irenaeus that is adopted by Schleiermacher, that uh, really the human uh, that that human beings, rational beings, they have to learn, and it's not only the the human beings that have to learn, but the whole system needs to learn to achieve the final stage of. Apocatastasis, which is again theology, theological. Sorry for that. 